so we're going to move forward with our next panel on, on policy. Uh, this will be a little uh, different from our morning sessions. So that timer is uh, <laughs> something I should get. Next time I get into an argument with my wife, I'm going to bring that. <laughs> um, so uh, we're going to uh, have more of an open-ended, uh, kind of broader conversation about, about policy. Uh, I would like to try to connect our conversation to everything we've, we've done so far this morning, the technical topics, as well as the, uh, the keynote. Uh, so I, so the, the basically, we'll, we're going to try to have um, as much of an open conversation as we can um, and uh, to address many of the issues that have, have come up. Uh, so. Again, just a level set. I think this is. Uh, I think we're all on the same page. We want to understand how this this technology can uh, eventually develop, and I think it is a lar a big challenge that requ will require the coordination or at least the cooperation of multiple different parties. Uh, to me, this area is wide open. Uh, there's still, uh, you know, we're in the very early innings of the game, and uh, as a community, I think uh, we can we need to think through how exactly this will work out. Um, with both private sector, public sector, and everyone in between. So let me uh, introduce our, uh, our panelists who will uh, speak about these issues. Uh, what I'll do is I'll do a quick intro. Uh, they'll kind of do a longer intro on themselves. Uh, it's always optimal that way. And, uh, and then they will give them a little bit of an opening, uh, opening statement uh, to talk for a few minutes about uh, their thoughts broadly on this topic. And then beyond that, I'll go into some leading questions and uh, if the discussion is not conversational enough, I'll try to be more provocative. Okay, so first I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Cliff Winston. Uh, Cliff has been at Brookings since 1984. He was the, uh, at one point the editor of the Brookings Papers on Economic Activity. Uh, also in a prior life, I, he was associate professor at MIT in civil engineering. Um, he has a, a lot of writing on autonomous uh, vehicles uh, and, and also on privatization and deregulation. deregulation. Um, he's had many uh, books and essays with colorful titles like Let's Deregulate All the Lawyers. Uh, he has a <laughs> PhD uh, from UC Berkeley, just like uh, everyone on the uh, A&M uh, infrastructure panel. <laughs> okay, um, uh, I'd li also like to uh, introduce uh, Cliff, oh, sorry I just did Cliff, um, uh, Rick. Uh, Rick is a uh, professor of policy analysis and management at Cornell. He's the, uh, the founding director of the Cornell Program in Infrastructure Policy, CPIP. So he is a, uh, a, a real expert on infrastructure policy. He was at the Council of Economic Advi Advisors three years before I was, so 2004 to 2005. And he has a PhD from my favorite university, uh, University of Chicago. Um, second favorite, A&M is my favorite now. Uh, Marjorie is a senior policy researcher at RAND. Uh, she has worked at the Office of Science and Technology Policy, and she was also an associate provost at Georgetown. She has written extensively on autonomous vehicle safety and policy and has an MPP from Harvard. So sorry to repeat the credentials. It must be my Indian American upbringing to constantly think about my, uh, my, uh, my credentials. That's how I was raised. <laughs> so. Um, uh, so that's, that's all I'm going to say up front, uh, and then I'm going to sit down, and then why don't we just go sequentially uh, from, from, my, uh, from left to right on my side, just to talk a little bit about, say a few more remarks about uh, yourself and about your views on autonomous vehicles, and then we'll get more specific. Does that, does that work? Yeah, five minutes. In a while. <laughs> Two articles were in uh, Sunday on autonomous vehicles in the paper. I'll go through those briefly to frame my comments. It's not to point out it was fake news, to point out it was incomplete news, which I'll fill in from the perspective of transportation economics. First one was in the Times, and it was one of these ones that says we're not going to get autonomous vehicles tomorrow. They'll be long off. What was really missing in that uh, piece was some historical perspective. It really would have been helpful to mention the airline industry. 1920s, even though the industry was going, there were many people who did not think we would ever have a commercially viable uh, airline industry. Even in the 30s, when the industry was moving along, people said, aircraft technology has peaked. We're not going to see better planes than what we've got now. Obviously, they were wrong. Same kind of problems are going to exist with autonomous vehicles. 
What would have also been helpful is to point out the development of the airline industry was not hampered by its own progress, but by the government. We learned that very quickly when we had regulation and deregulation in the 70s. We saw what that did, constraining pricing, entry, exit, so on and so forth. And remarkably, it exists today. We still don't have open skies on all our routes. And most importantly, we don't have cabotage. Foreign carriers cannot serve our routes. That'd be handy now, given that Boeing is grounded its uh, 737 MAX. All that could have been filled in with foreign carriers. Other problem is infrastructure. Still got public airports. Still got public air traffic control. You can't get any more efficient than either of, inefficient than either of those, and those have hurt the industry. Second article was in the Post, also on Sunday. That was one. What are the failures we've learned about autos that we can you know, learn to try to improve autonomous vehicles? Maybe you saw that article. I didn't get any of the failures out of there. I couldn't figure out what they were talking about. New Yorker has a similar one, equally bad. It's very obvious what the failures were. Again, all from highway policy. All the inefficiencies that have compromised automobile travel are going to make autonomous vehicle travel even worse. All right? Hurts the transportation sector, but importantly, which wasn't mentioned earlier, it, helps the, it hurts the growth of the economy. Okay, so my views on the industry are positive and optimistic when it comes to the private sector for an obvious reason. It's incredibly competitive. We've got U.S. automakers, foreign automakers, technology companies, and most importantly, there are huge stakes. This is not the case of GM making Chevy Volt, and if it doesn't work out, you know, they'll make money with SUVs. If it doesn't work out, they're through, all right? And they cannot count on 20 years President Ivanka Trump or President Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez bailing them out. It isn't going to happen. So all of them know this. This kind of t competition is exactly what we want, all right? So where are the problems in the industry? It's from public policy, all right, from the get-go. First and foremost, why didn't we have testing passed? What was the problem? Why couldn't Congress pass AV start? Why didn't NHTSA step up? They could have done it and got a national framework for testing, all right? It really would be nice if policymakers would get behind this industry and recognize what it could do. Second, infrastructure. This is public. Auto makers don't own the infrastructure. The public sector's really got to handle all of this, the city and state and ultimately national level. If they don't do anything, that's going to ground the, these uh, vehicles in their place. Finally, most importantly, what inefficient highway policy has done all the way down the line, inefficient pricing, inefficient investment, inflated production costs, regulatory delays, misallocation of funding from states and cities and so on and so forth, and most importantly, constraints on technological advance and innovation. All of that, huge welfare losses to non-autonomous vehicles, it'll do exactly the same to autonomous vehicles. That is what to, got to improve, all right? And if you don't think this is important for the economy, suppose Trump says, you know, I really had it with the West Coast and Washington State. Let's ground all of Boeing's planes. Let's really see what's uh, up with them. They'll never vote for me anyway. What do you think that's gonna do to the economy? It won't just be delays in the travel sector. The whole economy will be affected. Labor markets, production, trade, so on and so forth. So when you get improvements in delays, which is what autonomous vehicles can do, it affects the whole economy. We estimate about a one percentage point increase in GDP growth from autonomous vehicles. That's what's at stake. I will conclude with a positive note. The good thing about all of this is that everybody knows it. That is, the public sector is going to be competing. Cities, states, and government, national governments. And they already are, right? Bloomberg has a website that says, here are the cities where autonomous vehicles are being tested. They're going to have another one. Say, here's where autonomous vehicles are operating. As word gets out, and some cities and states are readying up for doing this, there will be political cost to this. So I'm hoping, in the same way that competition is really going to help this industry develop, no question in my mind about that, it will also put pressure on governments, expose the political costs, and hopefully billion-dollar bills or even trillion-dollar bills won't be lying on the sidewalk. So many ideas, so little time. Um, so uh, much, much to respond to. I, I wanted to frame some, some starting comments based on a handful of questions, but I think I should also address Korok's uh, 
zeroth order question, um, which is to observe that I have a long background, a career in, in science and technology policy. I've come relatively recently to autonomous vehicle safety, but that is the area in which I have been focusing when it comes to AVs. That said, I can draw from looking at the rise and the varied applications of information technologies across the board, including how policy has and hasn't worked in, in those areas. So my first question is, what is safety? And one of the things that surprised me in my recent work is there is no consensus definition. There's no consensus definition in general, and I found that out in talking to people at the National Safety Council as well as elsewhere, and there's no consensus definition within transportation. So at some level, we don't really know what we're talking about. In our work, we de define safety as avoiding harm to people, whether they're in the vehicle or on the roadway ecosystem. You heard about uh, crashworthiness from Derek Kahn. Um, that, that's one angle, and of course, it was interesting, he didn't mention there's also occupant protection, and that's another major strand of the, the federal safety standards. But if we look at the, the last decades of the, the previous century, you know, we've gone from 1950s and, and seat belts being very rare, but beginning to appear, to debating about different passive restraints in the 1970s, then the 80s, fuel economy drove us to reduce vehicle weight, which of course added to safety problems. And, and steadily through the end of the last century, we started to see more electronics in vehicles, which is what brings us to where we are today. Where and how can AV be measured is my second question. And that is one that, that we looked at in depth. I'm not going to go into depth at, at the moment. but. It is important, and, and again, Derek Kahn touched on this, to recognize that many things affect AV safety, beginning with the components. And so it makes a difference if your AV has cameras, radars, LIDARs, or everything, uh, since, uh, as we just heard, that, that sensor stack can be quite varied among, among vendors. Um, testing and measurement are immature. And I would say to my panel member on the left that that's one reason why we've seen some federal policy slowness, let's say, uh, because we don't yet know enough how to do those things very well. Um, you heard earlier that people talk about how many miles of a vehicle traveled. I have colleagues who estimated that a vehicle would have to drive hundreds of millions, if not billions of miles, for statistical confidence that there is safety. That's not happening. It's certainly not consistent with what we're seeing with the 1,400 vehicles you just heard were being tested. We are doing a lot of simulation, and simulation is very helpful. But as anybody who really understands simulation knows, you can only simulate what you know to be able to simulate. And so there are going to be situations that are rare but important and sometimes fatal that will not be captured in simulation. Finally, AV developers are not telling us what they know. And that makes it hard for policymakers to plan for safety. Part of that is because of the competition you just heard about. This is a great race, and people who are in that race don't want to share. Third question, can we compare AV safety to safety of conventional cars? Well, that's what everybody wants to do. We all know conventional cars. We want to make the, the comparison that's obvious. But a computer system on wheels does work differently from the combination of a human being operating something on wheels that has computers and other stuff in it. Um, the other comment I would make on the challenge of, of comparing is that it may be easier to avoid being a cause of an incident as opposed to being a victim of one, and that's probably true for both AVs and uh, conventional vehicles. If you imagine a three-lane highway, and if you are the vehicle in the middle with three vehicles to your left, three vehicles to your right, one behind you, one in front of you, if one of those vehicles screws up, there's not much that you can do about it. Fourth question. How much safety is good enough? And that relates to the question, is it reasonable to expect that AVs be at least as safe 
as human-driven vehicles. Safety advocates either want them to be at least as safe, some of them actually want them to be better. I have colleagues who did an analysis that showed that once you get to that at least as safe point, then there are benefits in terms of lives saved and other problems avoided by getting those as safe vehicles out on the road. So you should beware having uh, the, the perfect be the enemy of the good. And then my, my fifth uh, is a, a grab bag of what are some other important uh, considerations in the context for AV safety. First, AVs are not consistent in their design or operation. They, they operate uh, within specified sets of circumstances. And you heard that again from Derek Kahn talking about a thousand miles across the country and whether you, you do or do not encounter uh, other vehicles or, or pedestrians along that way. Um, we do expect the fleet to be mixed for a long time, and that's consistent with the slowness to getting meaningful deployment. There is a big difference in terms of safety between whether you have a minority of vehicles in the total fleet that are automated and then the majority are conventional cars driven by people as opposed to some anticipated future where most if not all cars are automated. The whole world works differently in that second scenario than in the first. Um, we do expect, again, you just heard a little bit about that, there to be more communications between vehicles, uh, between vehicles uh, and infrastructure, between vehicles and people, and so on. But that all isn't going to happen for a long time. When it happens, it will help with safety. So finally, uh, I would say that it's important to think about safety from a systems perspective. And I learned that when I looked at some of the work involved with what's called Vision Zero, the, the quest to eliminate all traffic fatalities, ideally by the middle of, of the century. If you're going to do that, you're going to change your vehicles, you're going to change your infrastructure, you're going to change your policy, you're going to change your incentives, everything will change. And so as we think about what it takes to make safety, we can't focus on the AV alone. We have to think about all these factors interacting together. Good. Thank you. Uh, so I'm not going to uh, spend any more time on, uh, I'll just get my clock going here, on uh, bio because I'm going to try to solve the world's most pressing policy problem uh, and offer a suggestion related to autonomous vehicles and do it in about five minutes. <laughs> so that's all I've got. So uh, you heard Derek Kahn talk about uh, megatrend, and the megatrend was uh, mass urbanization and along with it uh, increasing traffic congestion. So as the, the world middle class grows, people first they want to get a car, they want to move into the cities, and they of course you know drive those cars in increasingly dense environments creating uh, traffic congestion around the world. There's a whole slew of social problems associated with that. There's wasted fuel, there's wasted time, there's fine particulates produced from diesel fumes. That we sh have shown that babies who grow up near uh, increased diesel fumes have worse health outcomes. I could go on, but that is gonna be, and is, a huge and increasing uh, social problem. Now to the economist, economist looks at traffic congestion, Econ 101 says every bit of traffic congestion is due to the mispricing of the use of the road at that time. It's due to the mispricing of the use of the road at that time. That is, the price of the road is too low. If you could get the price of the road correct, you could regulate the market, both on the supply side and on the demand side, in order to make the flow of tra traffic through that facility smooth. So basically going at free flow. So imagine we could do that. Imagine we could, and the, the panel of engineers I think agreed that driverless cars are a way of getting people to accept road usage charges per mile a little bit better than they have in the past. They're a, a tool. So imagine we could do that. We could price per mile, but that price per mile is not fixed. That price per mile is variable, okay? Like the price of bread, the price of beer, the price of, uh, ties, I don't know, those prices vary, but they vary in real time. And the price per use of the road at that particular time varies. And it varies in a way to clear the market. So when an economist says clear the market, that means that the, the demand for road space exactly equates to the supply. 
and the cars flow through at maximum cars per hour. Now, you can imagine that uh, market for road space clearing centrally so that there's some, what we call an independent system operator, an ISO perhaps, that serves as the central clearing mechanism for that market, okay? If that seems, uh, I don't know, pie in the sky, as we sit here, the market for wholesale electricity, probably the electricity we're using in this room right now, the wholesale market, not the retail market, clears down to the second in a way to equate the supply and demand for electricity on the grid. The same is true for radio spectrum. If you went to Chicago, the market for number 10 wheat would be clearing that way. Right now, the market for pork bellies, the market for coffee, the market for orange juice, all these commodities are clearing in this you know, sort of constant way. So imagine now that we had that data, so we knew we were pricing not only according to per mile, but in a variable way, in a way that clears the market, and then that price data were plugged into your app, okay? And that that price was the key thing that say your Google Maps or your Waze, whatever app you wanna do, was telling you how to get to work. Okay, so you say, I'm gonna use an autonomous vehicle, I gotta go to work, I hit the button, how much is my trip to work gonna cost right now? Well, according to current road prices, it's gonna cost $6.75. However, there's a, there's a little arrow, and the little arrow tells you whether the price is going down or whether the price is going up. So if the price is going down, you wait 15 minutes, answer some emails at home, you have a cheaper road price to get to work. If the road price is going up, you say, gotta get in the car right now, give me that driverless car, I'm going to work right now, okay? So that is a, imagine both, not just a market currently, which is what we call a spot market, but also a forward market, which is what you have in almost all commodities. But the market is a new market. It's the market for the use of road space. And that forward market, if you're worried about price risk, allows you to hedge if you're a big user, say like United Parcel Service, DHL, FedEx, you wanna lock in those prices, you might hedge in the forward market uh, for road space. So that is um, the, the basic, I think, I think the key thing, we've talked about safety, critical issue, we've talked about potential time savings, less aggravation associated with driverless cars, but my hypothesis, my strong hypothesis, first is that we could eliminate all, I'm using that word carefully, all traffic congestion through accurate prices of roads that would clear down to the second or every few seconds and would have a spot and a forward market, and second, the leading to that, okay, to eliminate one of humanity's most pressing problems, in my view as an economist, would be the single greatest benefit of autonomous vehicles. If we could get people to think about the trip differently and the way they pay for roads differently, that would be a huge advantage. So if you want to read about this some more, <laughs> uh, I'm honored to have a paper in the journal Nature, the British journal Nature, with two esteemed economists, Peter Crampton and Axel Oakenfels. Uh, if you want to read it, give me your card that says, send me the nature paper. <laughs> and we have a longer, that's a, a comment almost. We have a longer paper in the academic journal called Journal of Institutional and Theoretical Economics that works all this out in gory detail about how the independent system operator would work. Peter Crampton has set up electricity, uh, wholesale electricity markets around the world. He's also set up uh, spectrum markets. And uh, you know we explain how this would apply to the market for road space. So as I think about this as an economist, I love safety, I think it's important. Um, I think there's a lot of challenges, but I would hope you think about uh, autonomous vehicles as leading to this new economic world where we accurately price the use of roads in real time. Uh, and I'll stop there. Okay, thank you, uh, panelists. So uh, let me just begin with uh, sort of a, a broad question uh, this morning, we saw that there are some uh, there are a lot of opportunities and challenges with uh, on the technical side of autonomous driving, uh, and then uh, Derek Khan said that we're a little bit slower on the timeline than he expected. Uh, can can you uh, all three of you maybe just speculate on how do we get to a path of, towards adoption, both on the on the private side uh, in in industry as well as on the on the public side, uh, in in a, in a in a, prescript, in a sort of a, a thoughtful and uh, proactive way? How would, we, how would that happen? 
Go ahead. <laughs> Which is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Oh. Yeah. no too much technology. They're not independent, right? I mean, right. the private sector, I mean, that was my point. The private sector is constrained by what the public sector is doing, mm -hmm. right? They can't just, I mean, there's sort of this Tesla fantasy. They can't just make cars and just dump them out there and say, go adopt them. I mean, this is not how non-autonomous cars worked, right? You realize that. Yeah. The way we have cars out here is they still have to go through a federal regulatory inspection, right, for, for, safe, for, you know, for safety reasons. And of course, then there's obviously licensing and all, and it's all that. So, you know, this is not going to be something they can do by themselves. They're going to try to work, obviously, as quickly as they can, subject to competition. But the government really has to take the lead, first getting the, te the testing framework nationally. I mean, you know, th this notion, Marjorie, that uh, Mitch McConnell and Elaine Chow held up the legislation because of their concerns about AVs, it doesn't make any sense. If they were so concerned, why are they allowing the cities to do it? We have testing going on all the time now. So they haven't stopped it. I mean, they could have taken the lead. They didn't. It wasn't one of McConnell's priorities, and I really do not know what Elaine Chow cares about. But the truth is, that's what happened. <laughs> and it's a fantasy to think otherwise. So that's where they have to happen. They need to take the lead to get that going. Then once that happens, then as we know, this is going to be a cooperative activity. We're going to, there's going to be a lot of learning. Back on that RAND study that says we need to go X trillion miles, it's ridiculous. It was a terrible study. There's learning by doing, right? You're not just going to have to go trillion miles. Each time you, you, you drive, you're going to learn a lot. So that's obviously going to cut down the amount of, of time you need before these things will get, get well. So point being is that then we have that secondary time when they're testing and they're learning. There's obviously going to be some cooperation there. I'm not quite sure how long that will take. You know, it depends who emerges as a leader, right? And how much politics will go in. You know they're going to be low-end people who are going to try to slow things up so that they're not going to lose. And then there's the final stage of then the transition to broader adoption. And then the policies that facilitate efficient usage. Again, all of this involves heavily involvement of the public sector. Right. And, you know, you know the history. It's not great about what they do in terms of constraining efficiency, innovation, and technological change. Marjorie, you want to add to that? So I, I actually was going to go in a, in, a, in a different direction, which I will get to. But I think what we just heard is that a reason we don't have a national framework is that we do have a situation where people are learning by doing. Not quite let a thousand flowers bloom, but we do actually benefit by having multiple experiments in multiple tar parts of the country by multiple government entities, multiple companies, and so on. And because they are all leading us in different ways, nationally and internationally, we are learning by doing. And although I haven't dwelled on the subject, I think that that actually provides a basis for not jumping in with a federal intervention that might be poorly informed and poorly formed. That's my response to my colleague to my left. But I think in terms of how might we move forward, it is interesting, you know, that there were some references by, by Derek Kahn to, to liability. And liability is driving many people to assume that when these vehicles come on the road, um, they're likely to be deployed as parts of fleets. You know, we can talk about Tesla all we want, which is making an individual consumer retail play, but we're talking about vehicles where if that sensor stack is not well maintained, then there is a risk that the vehicle will not perform as it is supposed to do, and if there is no human driver, then the only people who are going to be blamed are the owners, operators, developers of the fleets. They have a lot of incentive. To, to get it right, and I think that is how we're going to see some of the initial rollout. Yeah. So great, so to review, the, the question is how do we get adoption? Yeah. And uh, we go back to Cliff's point that all the infrastructure assets that are discussed here are publicly owned. Uh, the states are owned entirely, by, the interstate highway system is entirely owned by states. I don't think there's a foot of it anymore that's owned by the federal government. There's city streets, there's county roads, um, all these assets are owned by some public owner. 
uh, if there's not owned by anybody, let's go some, get some free infrastructure. But of course, <laughs> of course they are. So you have to deal with public owners. So one thing that concerns me about these discussions is, it was alluded to on the, the last engineering panel a little bit, is about the public ownership of the infrastructure assets. So to get any of this stuff deployed in a serious way, you have to take their interests and their incentives, their budget constraints, et cetera, uh, into account. So, uh, you know, running the Infrastructure Policy Center for the past 10 years at Cornell, uh, you know, I love these people. These, they're all wonderful. They are risk averse. If you're the state highway official, the worst thing for you is to see the, something about the highway system on the front page of the newspaper tomorrow. Uh, you get, bear all the downside, but you don't bear the upside. Uh, they're budget constraint, uh, constrained. So if you go with them to a proposal to spend money, uh, it's probably going to you know, go in one ear and out the other. So what I'm going to launch a term that I would like everybody to keep in mind. It's called value capture. Okay, I don't know how many people have heard of value capture, but you've heard of it. It's a great, I know Baruch has heard of it. It's a, <laughs> it's a great um, term that is gaining traction in infrastructure policy. So the idea is that there's enormous value in everything we're talking about. The, the value is latent in autonomous vehicles. Uh, there's safety value, maybe congestion reduction, et cetera. The question is, how do you share that value with public sector officials in a way that they benefit from the adoption? If I have time for a quick example, from my own town of Ithaca, New York, in upstate, we had a 100-year, I love sewage treatment plants, that's what I do. Uh, we have a 100-year-old sewage treatment plant, you know, the same thing with the, with the big uh, settling pools and skimmers, et cetera. Tremendous methane uh, dispersion into the atmosphere. Methane's a bad uh, greenhouse gas. Johnson Controls comes in and says, hey, folks, we will install a methane digester, which is a giant sp white sphere larger than this room, that will capture the methane as it's processed. We will use that methane to turn three or four uh, called micro turbines that turn at 120,000 RPMs. Those micro turbines will produce electricity for this plant, enough to cover the whole cost of the electricity for operating this plant. And we will install that technology to you, the city of Ithaca, at absolutely no cost. The way we pay for it is allow us to capture some of your reduced electricity bill. Allow us to capture some of your reduced electricity bill. We'll bond against that and raise the money to install the technology. I got a tour of the plant. It's so successful, this, the city of Ithaca sewage treatment plant is selling electricity outside the plant onto the grid. Johnson Controls or somebody's going to install another methane digester neighboring counties are actually bringing waste to be processed, paying the city of Ithaca to do that processing. And I believe the water discharged into Cayuga Lake is actually cleaner than it was before. So I urge us to think about applying that model to driverless cars. One super valuable thing are the uh, streetlight poles, right? The poles themselves, you can put up uh, cameras, 5G, etc. You can install um, LED lights instead of pressurized sodium that will give you more lumens at a lower electricity cost. Just share some of that with the public sector owner so that they gain and say, by the way, we want to, you know, help us with the autonomous vehicle thing. So think about those win-win situations that, are, that don't require the public sector to spend money and are low risk. And I think that's, that's, it's part of the solution. Thank you, uh, Rick. So I actually want to follow up on that point. Uh, we've heard a lot about infrastructure today, uh, and uh, you're an expert on infrastructure financing. And, uh, and tell us a little bit more about how uh, smart infrastructure in particular uh, could develop in the future under, under new and novel financing arrangements that were possibly not possible under, under the, kind of the, the, the older model. What, what new opportunities does this, uh, all of this new technology bring on the infrastructure side? Yeah, so, so um, great, great question. I mean, I think that um, a lot of old structures uh, should be relied upon first. And that's one, one of the things that I've learned as a, you know, sort of observer and commentator on this area is that everything in this sector is risky. Anytime, just think about building a bridge, okay? Kind of a common thing, but everything about that is risky. There's design risk in the bridge, there's construction risk, there's geotechnical risk, there's strike risk, there's operating risk, there's God of, uh, acts of God, force majeure risk. You know, I could go on down the line. And so the companies involved in this, you know, risk is like a hot potato. They want to get rid of it, right? And so they're trying to distance themselves or 
uh, control the risk as much as they can. So a disaster with the infrastructure doesn't bring down the parent company. So what they do, this is lawyer intensive, is they form SPVs, special purpose vehicles, which are these legally legally created entities that manage the risk. They issue debt and equity themselves. They are the actual legally contracting entity. So to deploy these, this new Trust me, this is all risky. What we've everything we talked about today is risky. To deploy this, uh, and that's the the key thing is that the debt issued by the special purpose vehicle is issued by revenues coming into the SPV only. So that's called project financing. Mm -hmm. So we would use project financing structures uh, particularly. One of the interesting things, I'll just just a footnote, is bond life. In other words, the bond market usually has five, ten, fifteen, twenty, you know, very fixed term bonds. And I think that uh, matching the, the bond life to the payback is, is getting more flexibility in that bond market, whether it's taxes and municipal bonds or taxable corporate bonds, is, is something we could do to help facilitate this. But what I would do is go back, look at, you know, there's a whole world of finance of this infrastructure finance on Wall Street and elsewhere. Take that expertise and think about how to modify existing project financing models to adapt to the new technology. Yeah, Cliff, go ahead. So an interesting thing historically in this country and probably everywhere else is modes, virtually all of them, lead infrastructure. We first had cars before we had roads. We first had planes before we had airports and air traffic control and so on. And that is how I think it's important to think about how autonomous vehicle infrastructure will evolve. We're going to first have the vehicles. They're going to continue to get better before we get the te technology and infrastructure to accommodate them. Now, what's going to be interesting, though, is the, effectively the pressure that autonomous vehicles are going to put on infrastructure providers. Normally, people tend to think about financing, which is you know, not unreasonable. However, there's going to be something else they're going to have to think about, and that is the performance of their infrastructure, because if it performs badly, it'll significantly compromise autonomous <coughs> It's vehicle's performance. If it performs well, it'll enhance autonomous vehicles' technology performance. Now, there'll be a number of ways, both economic and technological, that this infrastructure can succeed. As I noted, just messing up on pricing and investment in things that should have been done with non-autonomous vehicles but were never done cost us quite a bit, but that's masked over the fact that we spend so much money to cover it up and have trillions of dollars invested, that really will show up with autonomous vehicles. We will have induced demand, so if they're concerned about congestion and you don't introduce congestion pricing, that's obviously gonna compromise to a significant extent what autonomous vehicles can do. If you do not get, build the roads properly and you have a lot of potholes, autonomous vehicles aren't gonna like that. And that's gonna really hurt their performance as they try to figure out what to do. If you're gonna blow the chance to optimize on capacity and now making lanes thinner or narrower, which you now can do, instead of making them wider, anticipating there be free, free flow traffic that never materialize, that's gonna waste a lot of capacity. That's just on the economic side. On the technological side, that's gonna be harder because you're then gonna have to start interacting with the vehicle and say, okay, at various levels, at the street level, optimizing stoplights, things like that. The question I asked earlier in the day was basically getting at the point, we have not changed traffic light technology for decades. They're based on the assumed traffic flows that exist. So when you show up at 2 a.m. and see a red light and there's no one around and you're wondering why isn't this thing turning green or blinking red, you can thank the decades old policy that is still used to do that. Obviously that's the kind of thing we wanna be changing with autonomous vehicles. Then more broadly, trying to coordinate then massive movement of autonomous vehicles on highways and so on and so forth, that now is open for a lot of different explorations. Utah is partnering with a private sector uh, uh, entity. Um, Colorado is, po uh, is partnering with a private sector entity, all trying to look at best ways to do this kind of thing. But I think ultimately of the autonomous vehicles getting out there, they're gonna put the push on the infrastructure to develop, and then the competition will exist, and we will see what best practices are, and we'll see the costs and benefits of who succeeds. 
I would just add that picking up on the point I ended on about safety being a system, a lot of what's going to happen with AVs is going to fit into a larger system of activities. So land use planning is going to change. You know, some of that pressure on road use that Rick had talked about may, may change with AVs because they can go in sort of bizarre routes and park mm -hmm. themselves and, and do things that we don't expect to see with people, and cities are going to plan for that. Cities are, in fact, as, as you've just heard, working on their traffic um, management systems. And between them and the interactions with AVs, we now have new cybersecurity concerns. That's another risk that is going to drive investment, uh, because if you don't attend to that, you're, you're going to have huge problems. So I think systemically, we'll see a number of motivators for, for investment and for creative responses. So, so let's let's talk more about safety. As given that it, the Derek Derek and um, and Ken both said it's the kind of the number one priority, um, and and you've mentioned this before. So we're now in a in a world where say forty thousand fatalities a year on U.S. highways, uh, and there's one crash in Arizona, and Uber shuts down their their program. Uh, how are if there is such an emphasis on safety? How are we going to get there if t all technology is very preliminary and there's going to be some some growing pains? How do we how do we overcome that when, uh, even if there, and there's a long-term benefit, uh, but there's going to be short-term costs? And how do, we, how do we, as a society, get there? Well, you heard from Derek Khan that the projections have changed for when we're going to see significant deployment, real commercial deployment. And I think that that is a reflection of industry recognizing that the problem is harder than they thought it was. And so having this internalized adaptation is, is going to be critical. I think because of the competition that I mentioned before among developers, we have yet to see a true sense of shared fate. That is, it wasn't, oh, Uber had the problem, therefore I, Waymo, am, am clean. Uh, everybody suffers, public trust and confidence suffers when there's any incident. So one of the things that, that my report had, had recommended is that when there is an incident, because it is so uncommon, that people share information. And again, you heard Derek Khan talking about uh, an aviation example. But the more people in the business share information, at least among themselves, arguably also with, with the government, the more we will learn from these scarce incidents and be able to progress together. But the most important phenomenon that we see now is that people have, have lowered the, the, the temperature of their enthusiasm and the hype, and I think people are, are self-moderating. Can I address that? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> so it's, it, to me, it's great, great question, Kirk. So, so to me, it's analogous to what I tell my policy students at Cornell about type one versus type two air at the FDA. Yeah. Where type one air is you release a drug that actually harms people. <laughs> type two air is where you don't release a drug that actually helps people. Right. And you see the type one air, but the type two air is like an opportunity cost that you don't see. So I think part of the role of policy people is to emphasize the cost of not having a safer autonomous vehicle. So, to, you know, the weird things I calculate, uh, everybody, many people up here probably been to the Vietnam War Memorial and uh, look at all the, the names on that wall, the terrible loss. It takes us about 18.23 months to kill that number of people on U.S. roads and highways, okay? So that visualizes it. They're disproportionately young people, just horrible carnage on the roads today. So every week, every day, we don't have this new technology deployed all these young people, all those crosses you see on the highways, were being lost because of hum majority's human error. So I think the job of economists is to hammer on opportunity cost, use the type one versus type two error you know, analogy, and, and just say, look, yes, we know someone was killed in Arizona. It's, it's terrible, it's horrible, but we have to, th this is better than the massive you know, people drinking and people texting and everything else that's causing this carnage on the roads, and uh, just keep stressing that. So um, when Derek was mentioning his example, I don't know if any of you market-oriented people were thinking the same way I was, but he's talking about airlines landing and one of them having a problem and saying, you know, why 
can I share that with all my fellow pilots? Where was the FAA? When did the FAA take note of that? When did the FAA say, hey, we'll keep track of all of this when you have a problem, and we are in charge of promoting safety in this industry, and we will make it aware to all of you, you know, when a pilot has a problem at one of our airports. And then hopefully that will help induce cooperation. Where were they? Why did we have to have the private sector say, hey, why don't we organize and have a cooper cooperative effort where we solve this problem? Well, I'll give you my answer in a second. But this is how things work when you're dealing with the government. I mean, these are things now that are occurring even now. Already there have been coalitions of various automakers and technology companies now in autonomous vehicles to promote safety, okay? Whereas again, and I, I don't know why this hasn't gotten across, the federal government has to actually authorize the standards for autonomous vehicles for them to be sold. They can't unless that happens. Congress authorizes NHTSA to do it. That's what we need the legislation for. Then they can sell cars. They can't do it before that. All right, they have to take the lead. That's just the law, okay? And that's really what we, we should be looking for, but we're not getting that kind of leadership, all right? Ultimately, it's gonna come pushing from the private sector to do it, and they're frustrated because they really would like the public sector to engage, but they don't. Why? Status quo bias. If you look repeatedly, decade after decade, policies that should have changed long ago, they don't. And then when you have technology being such a challenge as it is, these guys don't know what to do. And that's what, and this is not new, this has been going on forever. And it's probably gonna continue to go on forever. It's gonna be an uphill bite. But hopefully, through these demonstrations, and again, this is a global effort, so it will get attention in this country too, We'll get somewhere, but it's going to be a lot harder than it has to be. Defend the government. <laughs> <laughs> I think, if I recall correctly, Brookings has published a lot of work talking about regulatory capture. And the fact is, in a lot of industries where there is regulation, the government can never understand the world as well as the people that it is trying to regulate. Sure. I cannot forecast I well enough what will happen in this space, but I have seen and read enough about what happens when regulatory policy goes wrong to understand that if the whole system, the industry, the government's at different levels, if everybody goes a little slower, maybe we have more of a chance of getting it right. So I have one more question for the panel, then we'll open it up. Um, uh, and the question is about uh, sort of long-term uh, costs and benefits uh, from autonomous transportation, uh, in particular for, say, the labor market and the capital market. And so what are some things maybe we haven't discussed yet of uh, benefits or costs of autonomous technology, say, for all of the truck drivers in the, in the U.S. today? or for the price of land uh, across, across the country? Can you uh, either speculate on that or offer any opinions? Okay, so I, I actually answered that, but let me, let me fill that in. You know, I, may, I told you there's an estimate of GDP growth. Okay, the intuition, I gave you one intuition with Boeing. Let me go back further. Let's go back to the Stone Age, when we did not have a transportation system, okay? So all your production was you know, where you lived in your cave. You, know, you worked where you lived in your cave. You know, so on and so forth. Okay, what did transportation do? What it did is enable you to get all the benefits of modern economy, economies of scale. You can produce and sell to many places. Product diversity, you, know, you didn't have to eat the same, I don't know what you ate then, bison or something. Um, you know, competition, uh, diversity in labor. You know, all these markets opened up. So you can think of Con the infinite congestion in the limit, that's the Stone Age. You can't move, all right? So as you get incremental improvements in congestion, basically what you're doing is opening up all the things in an economy that we get from a transportation system. And that's what autonomous vehicles will do. 
not just a transportation system, but they're going to open up all these sectors. Now, admittedly, we're not where we were in the Stone Age, but we obviously suffer from pretty extreme congestion. That affects everything, labor, trade, competition, so on and so forth. So the hope with autonomous vehicles operating efficiently with the right technology and the right economic policy is we will get these congestion improvements that will make the whole economy come, to come alive even more. Now, it's disruptive. Again, governments don't like it. Labor markets, some do. Some parts do. Some parts don't. Obviously, labor gets hurt when there's capital labor substitution. Okay, so the truck drivers, obviously, in, this, in, the, in the seat, they're out of work, all right? And that's the offsetting part or the negative part that people get, get uh, nervous about. It's disruptive, okay? But the two other parts that offset that that are very important, one, productivity increases. Output goes up more. So even taking the technology as constant, okay, you're at least going to do more and you need at least some labor. You're not completely substituting away from all labor to produce that output. But here's the big ticket item, new occupations. All kinds of things will open up with new technologies, jobs that we didn't have before, new things we didn't have before. And what's important is with the growth of the tech companies and the tech economy, most of the new jobs or a large fraction of the new jobs are in new classifications of occupation. So you put that all together and you're saying, yes, there will be some loss in, in, in employment from capital labor substitution, but productivity increases and the creation of new jobs are quite likely to offset that. And obviously, they're going to be, have to be adjustments, as there always are with a new technology. So I want to address that. So I agree with everything Cliff said. Cliff has done more analysis on this, but just um, kind of a broader, a broader view. If you think about transportation uh, in general, you know, it's 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 been treated almost like uh, utility, in, in the thinking about it. So nobody should go without clean water. Nobody should go without electricity. Uh, once we have that, nobody sh you know should go without a uh, number of other other maybe communications. Uh, nowadays, nobody should go without heat. And, uh, you know, that's just, I think, a great part of American society is we sort of believe these basic needs um, should be met. And that's been true for uh, transportation for a long time. So in the early part of the 1900s, there was something called the Farms to Markets Movement. And this was the idea that farmers had all these crops that they were, were growing more than they could ever eat themselves, and they wanted to get it to market. But a lot of the roads were dirt roads, so when it rained, they couldn't move their crops to market. So there was this rural road movement to try to get the farmers to allow them you know, to get their crops to market. And then the very name of the interstate highway system is to connect the nation together, sort of the old postal service notion of binding the nation together, except it was done through a, you know, a system of, of interstate highways. So as, as we, you know, move to this, this new technology, I guess I'll just tell another quick story. <laughs> Everybody here who's in D.C. in January should go to the Transportation Research Board meetings, the TRB. And I love that meeting, right? And they have an exhibit hall there. They have all cool, they had an autonomous car last January. It's early January. They had a car moving back and forth. You know, I think you could ride in it. And, but one time I went there, and it was a couple years ago, and there were these guys, uh, kind of interesting looking guys, standing next to the, a vehicle that was on one of the earlier slides, which was a, an autonomous bus, maybe six or eight uh, seater, right? And, uh, you know, I said, this is interesting. What do you do? I, was, I said, oh, the, they said that we're running this around Boston, right? And, and we're running. I said, you know, really, that's really cool. And I said, but doesn't that, there, there's an MTA in Boston. Don't they have exclusive rights to... Uh, operate buses in Boston. You know, I'm a policy guy, right? So how do, how do you overcome this? And they said, oh, we're running our autonomous bus where the MTA in Boston doesn't serve. I'm not indicting them, just doesn't serve these underserved areas. And he explained to me the way the app work. You have an app and they say, this autonomous bus, you, you are two blocks from this autonomous bus stop. Five other people want to ride this bus from A to B. Come to this uh, corner in six minutes and this autonomous bus will take you from A to B, okay? At a very low cost, okay? And so that's how they were doing it. So th there are these gaps. We don't think any neighborhood should be cut off 
from some form of transportation, there are these gaps in our system that I think autonomous transportation is filling, right? So I, th I see that. Now, how does that get back to your jobs question? A key thing is access to jobs, is that can people get to jobs? In New York City, where I spend a lot of time, it's really expensive to own a car, right? So you have to have some form of public transportation to get to a job. And I think that if we you know, creatively use autonomous vehicles, they can help solve that age-old uh, transportation problem of really providing universal service. Uh, and that's just one example. I would just add that when it comes to uh, when it comes to trucks, we benefit again from the fact that technology is not changing as fast as people think. So if you talk to people who are in the trucking industry, they talk about various assists, and they talk about first uh, assistance in the the long haul portions as opposed to the you know getting on and off of of a highway and so on. There are also people who will talk about how the age structure of the um, commercial driving population is relatively high because those jobs are not attractive to younger people. So there can be problems getting enough people to do today's trucking jobs. If you add that together with slower than some people would like to see deployment, you may have a self-correcting problem, which is not to say that some people will not lose work. Um, and certainly opportunities will be foreclosed. But as the new kinds of opportunities that, that Cliff mentioned come online, again, the system may regulate itself, and I end up being a little bit less worried about <coughs> trucking than, than I do about other kinds of jobs. Okay, let's, uh, let's open it up to questions. I know people might be nervous about asking the first question, so let's go straight to the second question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, actually, I would like to ask uh, three questions in one minute, if it's possible. Uh, Marjorie Bruton thought about uh, AV timing. Aren't we asking too much of AVs without providing a lot of support from all of us? Because the assumption is AVs are super intelligent machines uh, uh, looking for zombies on the uh, unorganized asphalt when we have urban planning that could organize the mo urban mobility by speed and by mo modality. And we have psychologists and educators that could educate the population in terms of behavior. A second question for Rick, if I may. Uh, land value capture and public goods and public value. My uh, overarching principle is if you have an agency that provides a public good, it should have an endowment. Endowment such as uh, uh, land-grant universities in this country, long tradition, such as uh, foundations, such as uh, uh, Metro that has land. Uh, public transit is one of those. So you can use land value capture like Tokyo and, and uh, Hong Kong in order to provide that additional support. Uh, third question to Clifford Winston. Um, Mayor Bowser wants to spend a ton of, mo ton of money to buy nine electrical buses. They would be expensive. No, no, I, I, I have a lot of respect for the mayor. This is my person. But that would be expensive to buy. It would be expensive to operate and uh, logistically difficult. Wouldn't it be better to use a pilot on those red uh, corridors uh, and have uh, something like Navia, you know, pilot uh, the uh, the shuttles, electrical and AV. Thank you very much. Yeah, just to give everyone a chance, maybe, maybe just answer one of those questions. We want to pick. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think in, in response to, to your question, when I was talking about um, a, a systems approach or referring uh, in response to something that, that Rick had said to, to land use planning, I agree that there are many kinds of planning, many kinds of personnel that have to complement the vehicles themselves. It's never just the vehicle themselves. And you know, we heard earlier about public awareness. Even some of that work, perhaps it's the psychologists you're referring to, to advise the public on, on what it is they can expect. You know, there was uh, 
a, a case in, in Boston where a consulting group got together with the city government, I think it was, and had a, an AV petting zoo. I mean, that's just a way to, you know, get people exposed because you have to pay money to get into TRB, and you know, we, we need to help the rest of us. Yes, yes. Yeah, let's just keep it quick so we got to. All right. Yeah. I'll, I'll alienate the rest of you. <laughs> uh, look, public transit was an experiment in this country. Okay, initially we had private transit. It was before public. All right, it's been a mistake economically, as it's turned out. It was an experiment that failed. From an economic perspective, if you look at the user benefits and even account for any savings and externalities and congestion reductions and compare that with the costs and now the huge and ever-growing subsidies they get, they are not socially desirable, all right? And the advent of network transportation companies like Uber and Lyft is just putting the final nail in the coffin. Transit was just a mistake. It'll be one of the benefits of autonomous vehicles is it'll make it increasingly clear that those systems should be eliminated and that we will have effectively personal transit companies. So I am not supportive of any spending on transit. If anything, I think we need to realize that subsidizing people like myself you know, from coming in from the suburbs really just has not worked out and that the mobility that autonomous vehicles will get us will give us the final uh, push to get rid of those systems. Okay, let's, uh, let's take the next question. Uh, let's see, uh, how about uh, right there? Yeah, you. Can you stand up so we can ident yeah. Hi, I'm Etta Nahapetian from Fairfax County, Virginia, and we are working on trying to get an autonomous shuttle happening over the next few months in Fairfax, and we're looking and we're focusing on making a transit solution because we think the opposite, <laughs> that we're hoping that these AVs become, um, help us get to uh, a transit solution so we don't have this crazy increase in traffic. As you might know, Fairfax is, has a lot of traffic. So um, we're really struggling with some of the regulatory issues and um, going through figuring out how we're going to work through the NHTSA waiver process. Uh, we're partnering with Dominion. Um, to, they're going to help purchase our vehicle, but we're, as we're trying to jockey to figure out what kind of vehicle we're going to get, we, we're struggling with the, with the NHTSA waiver process. Um, and I guess maybe this was a question for Daniel, for Derek Kahn, um, but do you know if there's any kind of movement to, to not make it such a black box? You know, it is a black box to local government to whether, um, what the regulatory requirements will be. The simple answer is I don't know, but that sounds like a question for the Conference of Mayors or League of Cities, who I know are looking at some of these issues. Okay, great. Now, next question up here in the front. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, I had a question about the safety elements of autonomous vehicles. If you look at um, sort of everything USDOT is saying and what a lot of the OEMs are saying, safety first, safety is our top priority. Um, presumably from the OEMs, that's because they see a consumer desire to hear that the vehicles are safe. But then what Rick was saying earlier is we already accept a vast amount of fatality on the road as consumers. And so there's something about our personal utility choice that we decide to make these trips when, when we know the statistics and we know how dangerous it is. So how do you reconcile that moving forward, what's, what's the barrier there from an, I guess, economics perspective, um, which I don't know anything about, and how do we push past to that? I mean, I guess it's, uh, to, go, to go back to the FDA, I'm old enough to remember the AIDS crisis, and, uh, you know, there, there were, was the AIDS cocktail, and the, you know, it wasn't a 100% solution, but the FDA was holding up the deployment of those drugs and the gay community got together and they they lobbied and they they demonstrated and they said look you know some of us have aids and this drug is available you know let us have it right so i would take i mean i it's it's a heroic uh, analogy but i would take that and again i think economists um, are not vocal enough in pointing out opportunity costs. This is something we cover in the first week of Econ 101, right? Is the things you do see 
you know, wh which are the people who, who die from the, the AV in, of, in Arizona, and the things you don't see. The things you don't see are the people who would be alive today if they had had an AV instead of the human air that's killing, you know, 30,000 people every year. And so, so I think the role of policy people and economists in particular is to be much more vocal about the opportunity costs and to say, yes, fatalities are terrible, but, you know, in, in the deployment of any, I mean, aviation was like that early on. It wasn't long after the Wright brothers flew that the first person was killed in, a, in an airplane crash. So, so you know, I'm, I'm not minimizing that harm, but I'm saying we, we have to stress the harm to society of not having the technology deployed, and these regulatory holdups are killing people. Uh, I, I, yeah, I could give you other analogies, but you get the point. What, what you're getting at, though, it, it's important, is, is the notion of what we call heterogeneity. See, there isn't this we. We're all different. In other words, when you look at the breakdown of auto fatalities, what do you see? You know, drunk driving, right? Texting. Not wearing a seatbelt, texting. It's what we call heterogeneity. All right, let me, I'm going to trash the engineers for a second. Okay. <laughs> There was a question about what major one should, should, should have to do this stuff. Learning a little econometrics wouldn't hurt. This is what the engineering safety works. It's just awful. They go out and they get police accident reports, all right, and they fit models of what we call severity, all right, and they use the data on the police accidents reports, okay? Were they drinking? Were they speeding? Was there a hairpin curve? You know, all that kind of stuff, right? And they you know, draw results from that. Well, the obviously dumb thing about that is this self-selection, right? You only are in that sample if you got it in an accident, right? It's not a random sample. What you'd want is a sample that has everybody, and most of those people don't get in accidents. Is they take actions, right, to prevent that. That's what autonomous vehicles are doing. They're eliminating the heterogeneity. All the dumb decisions that people have made to self-select and put themselves out in a snowstorm you know, when they run into somebody, you know, or after they've been drinking to run into somebody or run off the road, autonomous vehicles are going to say, sorry, you can be that way, but once you get in us, you're all the same, all right? And that's really how we're going to get the improvements is we're cutting the heterogeneity, making everyone the same. Okay, um, let's say, uh, yeah, go ahead. Hi, Carl Golovin. I'm wondering if a, a defining moment will come when uh, apparently Tesla is working to set up its own insurance company for Tesla owners, as well as its own collision repair, because you know, their cars are unique enough, you don't want to take them to a, you know, a traditional repair shop. So once the, the owners of Teslas and Tesla itself, through its insurance company, is willing to accept the liability, that the assurance that uh, they believe their self-driving vehicles are are sufficiently safe, they're willing to incur the liability. Won't that be a moment when all, many Teslas already on the road will become uh, autonomous? They're going to need federal approval before they can sell. They can, they can put anything they want in them. They cannot sell them and operate them. I also don't think that a model of complete vertical integration where a company does everything and self-insures is scalable. So it, it, it would be interesting to see what happens, but we've, we've heard a lot of announcements and pronouncements coming out of that company, and then reality, you know, looks yeah. a little bit different. Yeah, so exactly. I, I'm not going to worry about that yeah. one. Okay, let's take one in the front, yeah. Just, it seems like uh, these, this, I, I call this NEAT system, Network Electric Automated Transport. Um, it seems like these, this whole NEAT system is based on having a, a, you know, several hundred dollar mobile smartphone with a 40 to $80 a month data plan in order to be able to use it. Is there a way, you know, do you know, you see the future? being able to use and hail a system, uh, transport like this without such a device in your pocket, or is it just assuming that you have to pay this expensive data plan and have this hundred, you know, $400 iPhone thing in your pocket in order to use, uh, you know, uh, this uh, network transport? That, that's, what, that's my question. Thanks. 
Right now, there are a number of, of models that people are experimenting with for different kinds of platforms supporting mobility as a service. Some of them draw on public information as well as private information. This is a, an evolving space, and AVs are a part of it. My guess is that just as all of that kind of um, matching uh, and planning and payment services as that's evolving, we'll also end up with different approaches to accessing it. So if there is a digital divide issue, which is what I think you're, you're getting at, then we'll also be looking at some alternative you know, public kiosks or, or other options. They may not be as, as flexible as having a device in your pocket, but ideally, for reasons that have been covered by, by others, you know, government, local government will make that kind of thing happen. And we may end up with different kinds of technology innovation that will lower the costs of the communications and information aspects. Okay. Let's take last question. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Dorothy Robine. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, a comment to, to Cliff and a question for Rick. Um, and I usually agree with Cliff, but I think that uh, I think the FAA was very involved in the AS, IAS program. I know they were very involved in developing a sister program which uh, encouraged pilots to share information on near miss accidents. There were so few accidents beginning uh, around that time that you needed to start to extract information from near misses. And so the FAA encouraged pilots to do that and gave them the same sort of indemnification that the ASIAS program. So I would give FAA credit for, for that one. Uh, my question for Rick, uh, Derek Kahn said the federal government uh, was neutral between internal combustion engines and EVs. This was in response to a question. Uh, uh, internal combustion engines cre uh, create carbon emissions. That's another unpriced externality. Do you agree that the federal government should be neutral in the AV debate between uh, electric vehicles and or hydrogen fuel cell and internal combustion? You mean so you're asking my own personal yes. view on well, so your policy view as an economist? Yeah. yeah. So well, so, so I, I'm sort of in favor of electrification. I mean, I think there's there's a lot of reasons to. Uh, reduced fossil fuel usage. Uh, carbon dioxide is, is one of those. Uh, there's others. Um, one thing, so, so, and I think there's this sense that autonomous vehicles and electric vehicles are kind of converging. So just, yeah. you know, again, <laughs> to, to underscore my earlier point, my, I, I hope that a takeaway from my earlier comments is that everybody thinking about this will think about real-time road pricing as the third piece. Right, so autonomous vehicles, electric, and road pricing is kind of kind of converging, right? So, so I am not fuel agnostic, and and you know it would take a little bit longer to talk through that. I can think of a number of reasons. One thing though that that I'll just say that that I that is a cautionary note, and you know one of the great things about me as an economist studying infrastructure is I get to talk to engineers, a lot more different part of campus, and uh, they're very concerned about infrastructure resilience, particularly in the state of New York after Hurricane Sandy. That was a big thing for our state. And, and one of the things you do, and I'll, I'll just toss it out there, when you electric, rely more on electric vehicles, you integrate the transportation system with the electric system more profoundly. So if you were to, somebody were to take down the grid uh, and you can't get a charge on your vehicle, that's a, re that's a real problem. Right, and one, we study hurricane after hurricanes. One of the biggest problems is actually the impact of the hurricane on infrastructure itself is big, but people can't get fuel after the hurricane. The pumps themselves at electric at gas stations run on electricity, right? So, so that one of the problem, biggest problems, biggest impacts is the days after the hurricanes, where people can't get fuel. So, I'm, I guess I'm just cautioning to think about the impact of integrating your transportation system more deeply with your power grid. Because your power grid then should be much more stronger, resilient to either natural disasters, terrorist attacks, cyber uh, events, et cetera. So I'll just toss it out there. But I, I personally am not fuel agnostic. I think there's reasons to favor electrification. Okay, we are out of time. So let's, uh, let's respect everyone's time. Thank you to the panelists. If you have further questions, you can come up. 
Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.